player and immediately expect an improvement in their play without interfering with, you know, the coach. And I've always been sensitive about cooperative assistant coaches being to, able to support you as a head coach and uh, goaltending specialists and uh, skill specialist. But the, the game's changed so much. There's so much to continue to learn from it. So I yeah. just want to thank you for coming on and yeah. uh, just let you get back to talking about the things you are because uh, yeah. I'm just trying to set things up for the future, Sharks. Thanks very much, Dave. Keep her going. Yeah, well, well, I should also mention, too, you know, guys, I was way ahead of my time with skill coaches because I had back in the in the 70s, uh, late 70s and early 80s, I had Wally Kozak. <laughs> we had we had guys had different names for it. it was Wednesday Wally because he'd come out on, on Wednesdays with us in the morning and I'd give him the first half hour and he would work on skating techniques that applied to the game, like defensive skating for defensemen. He did some really good things at how to approach a puck carrier in the corner, uh, to avoid crossover starts and stops, uh, how to use T-stops, uh, posture, and all those things. And then, of course, with defensemen for gap control, uh, you know, and, and pivoting from forward to backwards and backwards to forwards, Wally was a, a genius. So we had, I, I, you know, I'm, I was a decent coach, but I also I always acquired top people to work with and uh and Co uh, Clody would I mean I'd, you know we had guys like Wayne Fleming Guy Sharon these are these are great coaches so I always made sure I had really good coaches with me because they make you look better and Wally thank you for your time I mean guys used to love when you came out and we'd I remember we videoed a guy named Paul Cavallini <laughs> Paul was a great guy and he had always had too many donuts I think he had donuts in the back of his pants because he was always he liked to eat and he was always probably fairly, he was overweight. And so the capital sent him to us and our, our task, we knew he was never going to be a national team player, but Hey, he was a great kid and he wanted to work. And, and uh, so we got his weight down and Wally worked with him on, on skating and man, he played, I don't know, 10 years in the NHL. And at one time, no one thought he'd ever play there. And I think a lot of that goes to Wally's skating work with, uh, with him because he uh, really improved his, his skating, and he really found out that if he was fit, he would be a better skater. So, Dave, I want to talk about Paul because there's two stories. Working with Paul, and somebody was videotaping him. Yeah, I did. Yeah, we he did. had to go in the corner and execute a tight, evasive tight turn. I still remember it, Wally. He wiped out and face planted. He kissed and the boards. It was everybody you just could hear us laughing in the yeah. background. Yeah, we used to uh, we used to use video in practice, like. Um, yeah. It was very common for us to take video and do video of some drills, especially uh, uh, defensive skating uh, forwards for, for the forwards, checking skating uh, for defensemen, uh, playing the rush, the skating involved in that. And uh, I remember that very well. While he both legs went one, his right leg went right, his left leg went left, and he just face planted and kissed the boards. And he looked like Bambi. Up. Yeah, it was Tim, great. Tim Bothwell. We were at the Max tournament in Calgary. And we ran into his, was it older brother, Tim? Yeah, Gino, Gino yeah. Gino, yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, you can mention, uh, we talked about Paul and the work he did, and he shared he shared the, you know, the positive uh, feedback with us about the experience of being able to work with you. And I was just blessed to be invited out and to get an opportunity to come on the ice with such talented players and, uh, that one day a week was very special, but I wouldn't have done skills work with you to that degree on the defensive side if we weren't playing the Russians. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have known you had to do it. Yeah, it's true, Wally. I, I, I've always uh, thought that, uh, I, and Clody played in that era too, so Claude can really, really speak on this one. Oh, yeah. it, was, it was really a, a privilege to play against the Russians at that time. Um you know, they were kind of untouched by the NHL. There was a few defectors, but, um, you know, they were, their teams, I can show you the lineups. They were amazing teams. And, uh, you know, Claude and guys like that that were good hockey players had to play so much above their head for us to be competitive. And I always had such a profound respect for the national team guys because um, they played together. I mean, we were we played as five. And uh, 
you know, we defended by committee and we mm -hmm. really worked at it. And, uh, you know, I, Wally, I think I look back and we had to do with a deal with those details because that was the way we were going to try to even the table a little bit. And, you know, it's interesting. It's really interesting to me. I used to watch, like I always, uh, and Claude Gagnon can uh, attest to this, uh, not so all the Olympics, but 1984, 1988, and 1992, there's U.S. and Canada, both similar teams, both a lot of uh, ex-college players, junior players, young teams. And the U.S. played a very, uh, what I say, really attack-orientated game. You know, they were going to try to outscore you. We always had to, we felt, to be competitive, play real strong defensively. And sometimes it hurt us because we couldn't score, but we tried to keep the game. We tried to you know, play a little bit stronger on the defensive side. Still had an attack, but we, we stressed more defense than maybe the Americans. I can remember the Americans, they'd come into the zone offensively and they would just absolutely crash the net. They'd drive the middle lane. They'd be on a wide angle. They'd throw it across. The pass wouldn't connect. There'd be a loose puck and off the Russians would go with a great transition puck. Our game was take the puck into the offensive zone, look to, look to go to the net suddenly and quickly. But if it's not there, take it wide and take it deep. Hold the puck, make them get into coverage, make them stop. And if we could get Krutov, Makarov, and Larionov stopped and get maybe they get a puck, but they're starting from a stop position, we felt our chances were much better. And in all three Olympics, we outperformed the U.S. And their teams were every bit as good as ours but our approach was different because we we wanted to be defensively sound. So I'm not saying it's the best way to do it, but uh, that's what we tried to do. And it was uh, a lot of your skating work, Wally, that made the difference. Yeah, Kinger, when we I first joined the national team there, early on, uh, you know, we were competitive until we went to, for the first time, anyway, my year, my years to the Zvestia Cup. I remember <laughs> my first shift was against... Uh, Larionov, Kudov, and those guys. I don't think we touched a puck once. And I thought I was a pretty good player. And until I played that game, I think we wanted to ask for a second puck after the first period. And that's when I realized I had to you know, work on my skating, uh, you know, quickness, read the play better, because as soon as we lost the puck, it was like panic time. You know something was coming. You yeah. didn't know what. So by the next year, we beat them. And that's, uh, you know. That's all the work that Wally did. In Dave, can you tell me that? Tell <laughs> them, Cody, <laughs> story after the first period. You came back from that Avesia Claude was at. Yeah. And you told me the story. They never touched the puck in the first period, and you, you heard the players talking in the dressing room. I don't know if you recall it. But yeah, yeah, they I can were talking coach talk. Yeah, they were. I can remember you tell uh, the story. I can remember the, like, and Clody's right on. I mean, they were so good. And uh, our, I think the coaching staff, we know how good they were, but our players were a little bit naive to it, probably, Cole. They didn't really, ah, uh, heck, it's the Russians, we can do it. And uh, like most typical Canadian teams, the hardest thing was to rein the guys in. Like, don't blow all your energy in the first five minutes because there's still 15 minutes left in the period. <laughs> you know, and our guys had to forecheck like hell. And we said, guys, uh, unfortunately, that's not a good idea because, you know, when, when you're fighting, when you're fighting Goliath, don't play by his rules, you know, play by your own rules, invent your own rules. And uh, yeah, I remember Wally, we, uh, we had a real tough period. We didn't get the puck very much. And uh, uh, Guy and I were coming back into the, uh, to the uh, locker room. We were standing outside talking, comparing some notes and I could hear the guys inside and they were saying all the things that we had worked on like for months about, you know, force a pass, ride the passer. Don't chase the pass, guys. You got to make sure you ride that passer a couple of strides so they can't make the return play. And uh, they knew all those things. And so we came out for the second period and we were a better team, you know, and they basically, we didn't say very much because they said all the right things. They knew we had, a, we had to adjust our game. We had to compromise our game, Claude, because they were so good. We couldn't... Uh, we couldn't match that type of game with them. We had to play smarter. We had to play a different style of game to stay in the game. And, and it, it, that was one of the greatest things I think in coaching is when you can stand outside the door of the dressing room <laughs> and you hear your place, your players saying all the right things. Cause then, you know, they're getting it. 
They're just leave them alone. They're getting it. Mm. They're they understand. As a French guy, the first uh, <laughs> term I learned was head on a swivel. I heard yeah. it so many times, and yeah. my neck yeah. is still sore. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, well, we we gotta, we gotta you. guys, Claude really, really improved as a player. Like he became a very complete player. And uh, uh, I wondered at some early. I thought, my goodness, I don't know if we can get Claudia there or not. <laughs> but when you have an attitude like that and you're prepared to work like that, uh, you can accomplish great things. And Claude was always one of the guys I thought came a long, long way in becoming a real good hockey player. Uh, Sorry, Dave, I want to tell a story of your, after your first year of coaching, and I, you asked me to come and do some skill work with you. You knew I'd played with the national team yep. and might have some ideas that would be helpful. And, and you really had a play without the puck orientation. And you might have even... Well, we did select players that would be better without the puck than with it. Mm -hmm. And then I remember that year. And you said, Ten years ago, my brother Matt. Yeah, and then it's you really said, hot. we got to have the puck. Yeah, we got to yeah, pick some skill players. So you changed yeah. your mindset a little bit. Yeah, we changed our mindset. We did realize that we had to get players good job. Really, since I don't have the 10 bucks, let me 10 bucks. I don't know what we got on here, but anyway. That's Hey, oh, that's uh, Tom oh, Malloy. He's, yeah. with, he's a regular Skype. He's as, as old as you and I. Yeah. Still yeah. coaching. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Tom. Good to see you. I can tell you, Wally, we did change our mindset a little bit. We did realize, you know, we had to score goals. And that's kind of why guys like Claude came into our program because, you know, they came in with amazing offensive skill. And all our hope was that we could make them better defensively without taking away their offensive abilities. And, and we started to recruit players like Clody that we thought, you know, you give them a power play and, and they'll create something for you. And so, yes, you did. We did change our mindset in 84. We just defended, defended, defended in 88. We tried to play more of a complete game. And then in 92, we had a real special group that was really, really good. And, uh, you know, we were able to play uh, maybe even a more complete game in the 92 Olympics. The, uh, just for the group, uh, Dave, Dave was definitely a pioneer in his thinking, and he's still thinking like er, better than ever before. And Dave, I phoned Linda while you were on, and just yeah. I, I got connected, and yeah, and she said your uh, your fire goes on and the sparks on when you're talking hockey, and that's the way it is with all of these guys. Yeah, I I agree, Wally. When I talk on the phone, it's embarrassing sometimes because. I start off talking hockey, say it's George Kingston, and by the end of the conversation, I'm almost in a full coaching mode, you know, and my voice is loud, and uh, I, I, I'm like you guys. I, I love the game. I like, uh, I, I like my job. I think it's, uh, I don't look at it as being a job. I've enjoyed every minute of coaching, and I find it very fascinating, and I have really find we're lucky to be in a profession where we can learn things all the time, and I've tried to stay, I mean, I have. I stay right up with the game. I... I can tell you, my book will show you, I, I do understand how the game has changed. I taught, I was part of that with, the, with Dave Tippett in Phoenix and uh, other uh, places I've coached. Um, but yeah, I think that's the fun in the game is uh, having, if you've got passion for it, you're always trying to get better at it. And, uh, and when you learn things too, you're stimulated. And it's the same with players. When they learn things from you, I think they feel stimulated and feel like, hey, I'm getting better. And anytime a youngster feels like they're getting better, uh, they stay with activities longer. And I, it's the same with coaching. You guys all must feel like you're getting better. You enjoy learning more. And so it stimulates even after you're act, maybe not actively coaching like I am to to study the game and still stay current with the game. Dave, uh, Tim Bothwell, I, he coined the name of this group. We call ourselves the No Dead Sharks. Yeah. And the story behind that is exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah, this group here is is on because we know how much we know how dumb we are, and we get dumber every day <laughs> because there's so much to be learned. Yeah, and the open mindedness to lifelong learning, and yeah, Tim is the guy that got the cups and and the, and the, the coined the phrase from the Woody Allen movie. Yes, 
about what a shark is, swimming, staying, breathing, moving forward, staying alive. And, you know, that's the essence of this group. So when we discuss things, and, and that's why I'm so intrigued with your train of thought, because many of the things you've talked about, we've talked about many times, uh, but we're talking about different things. Barry, Malord, uh, Barry Midori alluded to the difficult challenge of developing an ethical coaching bench in minor hockey so they can enjoy yeah. the game, right. which in fact leads to winning the game. And that's yes. the philosophy of using all your players. And so that's another side. The other side, Daryl Belfry's completely different thinking um, beyond anything I've ever imagined before. And so this, when this group gets together, we end up talking about stuff. And lately, because the NHL started, yeah. we've talked about some of the nuances of what they're doing. And in my mind, the NHL game, <clears throat> for the competitive game, and Barry, your, be your POE teams, and Barry's the mentor of all the U-17 teams in Canada, the three regional teams. Yeah. Uh, the NHL game sort of is the observable bar of where the game is going. Now, your observations and ideas are beyond that bar. <laughs> How are they going to change in the future? So I'm just trying to convince, yeah. him, stay up with the game today. And to me, Daryl Belfry is on to something uh, with the coaching communication piece and being able to communicate with the players, use questioning and have discussions with them with the same passion that we have. Yeah. And be able to get specific results working on skills to a degree that I never did offensively yeah. or defensively. Mm -hmm. So those are the things down the road. I'm, I'm just. Uh, Wally, if I could just build on that a little bit. Sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. No, I was just thinking about that too. Yesterday and uh, last week, I had some time to do some uh, contemplation and reading. And, uh, you know, this pandemic has given us all an opportunity as coaches to, to look reflectively and uh, decide if what we're doing is right. And uh, so I, I've been taking a look at uh, the uh, athlete development model and, and uh, so, sort of the building blocks of that. And, um, you know, are we doing the right things with our athletes in terms of building uh, proper potential around physical movement and is there an, uh, a capacity to improve that and uh, when we look at a hockey player's uh, physiology and their physical capacity um, is there room for improvement and there is be <laughs> when we compare it to other elite athletes and then uh, as uh, Mr. King uh, alluded to uh, a little while ago in terms of mental training you know we we tend to think that we're we're kind of sophisticated when we come to our uh, sport uh, psychology and our, our mental training, but really I think we're just scratching the surface. So we've, we've given an up, we now have an opportunity in this pause and by the formation of these groups uh, to really uh, advance the game uh, in a dramatic way. And it's, it's exciting. Malcolm and, and, and Dave, I see that Kim McCullough is on. Dave, we have a group of people that mm -hmm. a cross section. And and Kim, uh, and I don't know if she's finished the book yet, uh, Daryl Belfry's book, but mm -hmm. she has been Zoom coaching and running the Leaside Minor Hockey Female Association, the largest in the world, yep. this year. Wow. Ivy League grad, coaching yep. a junior female team. And... Uh, Absolutely brilliant and applying. She did a Zoom session last night on hockey IQ and skills. Mm -hmm. She's doing another one on hockey IQ and tactical play. Mm -hmm. But the ability to com combine the thinking behind these new unique skills, mm -hmm. that was what she did last week. And yeah. I edited 54 minutes from that with, God, uh, she must have had 70 people on. Mm -hmm. But it was 
all that advanced stuff, and I'm going to send it out to all the sharks this week. And Dave, I've now got your proper email address. Yeah, thank you. Walt. And your phone number, which yeah, or Linda's phone number and yours. But I'm going to ask just so you get to meet Kim. She, uh, uh, Kim, would you please just explain what you picked up relative to the doing the Zoom sessions, and then the last one you did, which was. To me, off the charts, stuff that nobody's done to that degree yet, but it's going to go that way. Kim, are you still there? Keep in, keep in mind, Dave, that Kim is lower echelon Ivy League Dartmouth. And, oh, yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Can't okay, see sorry, you, I'm doing, we can hear you. No, I'm, I'm doing Skype on my phone. I was trying to be a good parent. Uh, Dave, it's an honor to uh, chat with you. I have a six, four, and two-year-old as well, so awesome. that's my other job. Uh, so I was at, I was at the park with them, um, chasing dogs while we were chatting. But uh, yeah, thanks, Wally, for that lead-up. Yeah, I've, I guess um, I've just been trying to innovate, keep the players engaged. I ironically got a brand new job, being the director of hockey operations of the biggest girls' hockey association in the world in a year where we don't play any hockey. Um, so uh, the Zoom calls and the workouts and the skill sessions, the mental training, the video is something I've been doing for a long time. So uh, in addition to all the technical and tactical on the ice, it's uh, it's been fun for me because all the stuff I'm doing is already in my wheelhouse and probably fell by the wayside most seasons when I was coaching uh, because you know, I was too busy trying to figure out the breakout and how to win hockey games. So uh, it's really skewed towards the developmental side of it purely. Um, and, you know, as Wally said, I've averaged about 70 to 100 people on all my uh, hockey IQ calls so far and uh, with Lee side. So hopefully it has an impact. It'd be nice if we could get back on the ice to see if it has an impact. Um, but it might be a couple months from that still. Anyway, I'll send that out to you all. And, and uh, um, I guess well, we'll one person, I, go uh, ahead, Dave. Yeah, if I can interject, I, I really think that uh, we're kind of all talking about the same thing. I, I when I listen to all you gentlemen talk and uh, about and, and Kim talk about the game, you know, I think we're trying to uh, if 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 young people understand um, whatever activity they're in, if they understand. Uh, why they're doing it and then how you do it. I think they do it better. And I think that, uh, you know, a, a lot, coaching is really, we're trying to create intentional improvement. We want kids to really uh, try hard to improve. We want our youngsters to understand they can get more out of themselves than they probably thought they could. And all that stems from one thing, though. I think you have to love what you're doing. And that's really important for us in coaching is to do all the things we can to enhance our players' ability to get better. We have to enjoy it. They have to have fun doing it. And uh, if they do, they develop a love for the game. Once you get a love for the game, you can ask Claude, if you get a love for the game, you can put a lot into it. And, and, and you start to realize, I can do more. I can get more from it if I put more into it. So a lot of it, to me, uh, and that's one of the greatest things about our era, Wally, for a lot of the coaches in this thing, is that when we started playing the game, we played it outdoors. Before we, we developed what we were... You're fading out a bit, Dave. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just saying to you that I think if kids love the game, there's a better chance they're going to stick with it longer and get um, more from it, more from the coaches that, that what they have to offer but it all starts with environment and it all starts with uh, so I always tell coaches like hey, I'm I'm all for uh, teaching kids and working with them and trying to keep you know make them better but don't forget where it starts it starts with the enjoyment of the game and I think that's uh, always that I, at one point in my career I think I didn't maybe think about that enough now at the back end of my career I start thinking about those things a lot uh, Dave, I've, we yeah. have a, a gentleman on. I don't know, Jordan, you're, he's a principal of a school. Yeah. I've worked with him coaching. Uh, he's mentoring him, uh, coaching a 
triple A midget girls team for a number of years. Yeah. And uh, the story he told uh, a week ago, and I don't think he's on now, but I find it more useful, purposeful than any X's and O's that we talk about. And uh, Jordan, uh, hello. He is on, Wally. He is on. You finally got back on, Jordan, because I'm talking to you about you and the phone call we had yesterday trying to get advice about, gee, Daryl and Dave might be on together. I don't know what to do. I'd love to have them both, a pioneer in the future. But anyway, I, I told him that, you know, lately, because the NHL started, Dave, all the talk's been, what are they doing? How do you play that? rush that uh, Simmons scored a goal on and who didn't, how important is back checking and sorting it out. It's all X's and O's. Mm -hmm. And I told Jordan yesterday, I love that stuff. But the most important thing I said, I'd rather hear the story that he told observing his grade two teacher and what she did in her classroom, because that's sort of what coaching has got to come to. And it's related to the ability to ask and engage this player or the student. Yes. Now, Gordon, if you could quickly summarize that, introduce yourself to the group. And Malcolm, I don't know if you were on, but that that episode, I've, I've edited it and uh, shared it before. But that's what I do with these sessions, Dave. I'll edit it and promote everything that everybody's doing. And yeah. Jordan, that little story just for Dave and that it's sort of a link of what Belfry's doing to a degree and what Kim's learning to do when she does her her work with kids. We want coaches to go from yelling to telling to asking. Mm -hmm. Now you engage them. Go ahead, Jordan. Thanks, Wally. Um, and thanks, Dave, for, uh, for all that you've shared this morning. I've got... Uh, couple pages of notes already and uh, uh, I won't uh, I won't go through the whole whole experience of uh, observational practices with uh, with teachers or that but I was just sharing with Wally in the group the other day that I, I popped out of the session and uh, was in to do a formal observation uh, and then pop back in on the session um, when I was in with the this uh, young teacher and I like to give the millennials a hard time about their lack of work ethic and all of the things that uh, they're being told that, that they have. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I uh, was observing in there was uh, how she was uh, engaging the students and how she was inspiring their curiosity. So one of the things when you mentioned this morning about uh, uh, you being curious as a coach, it's also getting that curiosity to go across uh, to your players or across to your students. And uh, so she's a, an exceptional teacher in that. And our master teachers are that way, whether they're a, uh, a new to the profession or somebody that's been at it for 25 years. And, and uh, I think that, uh, well, you just mentioned it, uh, creating intentional improvement. Well, that's something in education that's been being around for a long time and you're wanting to create the, the opportunities for that improvement to occur. And uh, it's it is intentional that it's not just by happenstance that it's occurring. So, um, yeah, we are seeing that a lot in the classroom and there is a lot of crossover between the two uh, pieces. And uh, I uh, I had never heard anyone uh, say the that uh, idea of uh, uh, decisions are are made with your mind and choices with your heart but I definitely will be using that one and stealing that one from you uh, I really like that one as well and I think that that also is true in everything that we do uh, as coaches and as educators and and those pieces and and uh, um, one of the things that uh, uh, yes, I, I love the, the X's and O's talk too, and I learned so much from uh, so many people having so much experience uh, uh, on these calls and, and seeing things differently and, and uh, at times or pointing out the, the little intricacies uh, as we go, and, and some of those are extremely uh, uh, fun, but I think that uh, um, as Wally's talking about, and I think that the general 
uh, message that you're providing, Dave, is is uh, about that the importance of you as a coach, and and I I uh, uh, appreciate uh, how how you uh, talked about the growth that you've experienced uh, through your years, and uh, especially that piece uh, of admitting that uh, you uh, were someone that was uh, always adept and organized, and and that side of the of uh, the game piece. And then, uh, then the other part uh, of it was looking at maybe needing to know your players as as uh, people uh-huh. uh, more. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, um, I've always been fortunate to work with staffs in schools. That when you uh, start talking about the making the connections with students and the importance of knowing students and meeting them where they are. Uh, that is such a transferable piece uh, to coaching and such a key piece to teaching and, and coaching. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm just being a fly in the wall again and, and uh, learning so much uh, you. from uh, your experience. Dave, I want to uh, pump your tires a bit. Oh, God. I don't know, Jordan, if you knew. Uh, Dave taught at old Aiden Boehm Collegiate. Yep. He, took, he took a risk to leave there to coach Billing Binghorns. They wouldn't give him a leave. I got a leave to go to Japan, but they wouldn't give him a paid leave. So he said to hell with it and look where he is now. Now, what you don't know about his role at Aiden Bowman, uh, Dave was a master teacher and he was a science teacher and won an award. Dave, I wonder if you could, I think that's really valuable. It's just an indication of uh, your teaching ability and your brilliance in your science class that, boy, to get you to transfer over to hockey, our sport's pretty pretty ben- benefiting from it still today. So would you relate to that and don't be modest yeah. about it. It's an off the wall activity at a high school, in a high school science class. Yeah, we, uh, I, I was fortunate to teach biology, which I enjoyed very much. And uh, I also taught a little bit of physical education as with that. and. Uh, in our science class, we had a quite a large section on, um, you know, uh, environments within the province of Saskatchewan. We have lots of sloughs and lakes in Saskatchewan. So the other biology teacher and myself, we designed an underwater observatory. And we went to very, there's various uh, foundations you can apply to. We think, I think it was the Hillroy Foundation, the, the note to textbook and the notebook company. And they gave us a grant and we actually built in the school we had a little area. We had this thing excavated. We had a company come in and put this underwater, like a little submarine submerged in the in the soil. And we had the slough outside of it. And they could observe, you know, frogs, bugs, everything uh, underwater. And uh, yeah, we did win an award for that. It was uh, lots of fun. I mean, that's what, uh, you know, we had a lot of kids that loved biology, wanted to get more from it. And we did that to provide them with... Uh, better learning situation. So yeah, I was always very lucky to uh, to have some diversity, not just to my coaching, but also my teaching. And uh, I think the other thing that's really important for all of us is when you work with, like I've been lucky in my whole life, I've been involved with so many amazing uh, teachers and people uh, as a student. And then all the way through, I had a profound respect for uh, how teachers helped me. Because as a student, uh, when I was in grade three and four, I was a bit of a problem student, actually. I wasn't a great student, and I was misbehaving. And uh, there was a lady named Mrs. Helen McMillan in grade five that got hold of me. She changed my life. She All she did, she knew I was a hockey player and played baseball and football. And she would, in the morning, ask me, how was your hockey game, Dave? Well, I see you guys, I, I, me in the paper, I see you scored a couple of goals last night. And all of a sudden, I couldn't perform any better in class. And I, she made me under, she motivated me to learn. And uh, I just thought that was such a telling moment for me as a young student that I never forgot that. I've always felt that, uh, you know, obviously when you're motivated by people, you can learn from people. Uh, they take an interest in you as a person, not just as a student. Uh, that's an amazing thing. So yeah, I've been, you know, it's interesting, the, the late Wayne Fleming, um, a great coach and, uh, everybody in coaching, we have our, uh, 
what do you say? We have our little stories and he used to always use one I really liked. Um, and it just, and this is the skill in teaching or coaching is telling stories sometimes can be really, really effective. And uh, he was working with our defenseman uh, on our four check. And he, he said, and I could hear him talking because I was talking to force, but I could also hear Flemmer talking. And he said, uh, he was thinking, uh, he said, guys, there's three things. There's the egg, the chicken, and feathers. And I'm thinking, holy God. So I quickly let the forwards, I kind of slid over and get closer to Flemmer. And he said, guys, when you're pinching on the forecheck, the first thing you're after is the egg. That's the puck. If you can't get the egg, then you got to get the chicken. That's the man. If you get neither one, you get feathers, and that's not good. And, and those defensemen, I mean, they just, Tim, you played defense, and uh, TJ played defense. I mean, the light bulbs went on. I mean, it was... So a good story, uh, that's the quality, uh, that's the kind of thing in teaching and coaching that makes you exceptional. And uh, so I've been lucky to be surrounded by lots of good coaches. And I think the other thing is uh, everybody, you're all doing it right now. You want to learn, you want to get better, and it keeps you uh, excited about uh, our game and the fun it's going to have for kids. And I've got two grandkids. I've got uh, one of them now is a second-year student at Dalhousie, my goodness. And the other one is still in grade eight or nine in, in Moose Jaw. So uh, I've watched these two guys play hockey and enjoy it and love it. And uh, it's a big part of our family. Linda, my wife, she's a hockey expert, guys. Uh, seriously, she watches the games and she points out more things to me. I think, holy God, you know, it's all, it's osmosis. <laughs> Dave, you mentioned your grandkids. And yep. uh, Barry, I wanted to... <clears throat> You told me your, your son was a head of a minor hockey association here in Calgary. Yeah. And over the years, he ran schools. You supported them. I came and helped you out at one. And uh, recently, you've talked to me about uh, the difficulty that your son encountered and your grandchild encountered. And they chose to play community hockey and not play double A hockey. And that's sort of the. The, your story there resonated with me. The behaviors of the players, uh, some of the players on the on the AA and AAA teams and the organizations, caused you and your son to focus more on community hockey than competitive hockey. And uh, I wonder if you could share a bit of that because we how uh, this group is dedicated to ethical coaching and technical coaching. So, boy, I'd like you to share that story to the group and then maybe get back to talking about your book. But I know it resonated with me because that's how serious the problem is at the AA, AAA level. The behaviors that are created by the adult environment and competition and the score clock, uh, it, it really seems out of whack. So, Dave, if you could, please. I think we lost him, Wally. I'm just trying to, he just clicked out. I'm just trying to see if I can re-invite him here, but uh, okay. I don't I don't know that it's going to work. Um, I don't see his... Uh, I'll call Linda. <laughs> yeah, he could text her and get her back on. Yeah, I'll just shut my sound off. But in the story, it's a typical thing. They... Behaviors of some of the kids was a problem. They didn't want to put him in that environment, the dad. And oh, there he is. He's back. Okay. Thanks, Linda. Sorry. Thanks, Linda. Tech expert. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Technology, guys. Got to be careful. Stuff happens. Dave, Stuff did you hear happens. my question about... Uh, yeah. Your, can, and really, <clears throat> this group, uh, I've convinced them to ap approach this dedicated time voluntarily for growing and learning to ethical coaching and then technical yeah. coaching. And that story of yours is something that I think would support that that side of it. Yeah, I, I think it's very important, Wally, that, uh, you know, ethics and coaching are really important because um, you're not going to create an environment that's a good one without proper ethics. And uh, so it, it transcends everything. The trouble with with it is some coaches don't want to hear about those things. They want 
more drills, they want tactics, they want game understanding, and they fail to realize that uh, it's your environment that sometimes makes the largest difference in the whole thing. And so, uh, you know, you got to keep doing that. I think it's really important for us at our age when we're a little older to help uh, the younger coaches understand that you can't forget those things. Those are, I mean, I can remember going to clinics when I was young and I, all I wanted was more drills and more tactics. When people talked about the philosophy of coaching, I kind of, oh, I sat back and thought it wasn't that important, but I've learned that that is really the key to doing a good job and having fun at it and having the kids have fun at it is your uh, approach to creating an environment. So yeah, for all of us, it's very, very important. And you're right, Wally, my son, Andrew, has been, he still is with Trails West in Calgary. I think it's 25 or 26 years now uh, on the executive. He's the president still. Uh, he's coached ringette as well as he coaches hockey. Um, so my son, Scott, he works at Prairie Hockey Academy in Moose Jaw, and he coaches assistant coach with the Moose Jaw Warriors in the Western Hockey League. So uh, we have a lot of hockey uh, in our family. And my daughter, Jennifer, lives in Lloydminster, and things aren't that great. Now, because she's a devout Detroit Red Wing fan. Oh. And when they had the Stanley Cup, so oh, she flaunted it, let me tell you. Mm. Now, I can't find her now when I want to talk to her about the wings because uh, things aren't so good in Detroit land. Dave, you should put her in touch with Jamie Pegg. He's the same, longtime uh, yep. Detroit Red Wing fan. <laughs> yep, that's me. Gordy Howe. I still love stories about Gordy Howe, you know, and. Uh, uh, have you read, anybody here read his, uh, there's a new book out on Gordie Howe that is very good. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's the most recent book on Gordie. It talks about his evolution of his career. It's quite interesting from a, a young guy born in Floral, Saskatchewan, and well, actually born in Saskatoon, and uh, his whole evol evolvement to becoming a, a player and uh, his personality, all the things he had to overcome. He stuttered, all those things. Things people don't know about Gordy that uh, are in this book. It's quite interesting. He uh, had to overcome some learning disabilities and severe shyness and uh, introvertedness. And uh, it's quite a story. It's very interesting. Dave, is there any other part of the book like um, that, that you can share with us that would tweak our interest? Like, I'm really curious, and I can't wait to get a copy of it. And and uh, once I do, I'll start reading it, highlighting parts, and then I'll start sharing tidbits and promote it because I I know uh, just listening to your talk initially, where I met, missed the first thirty minutes, um, there are very few people that I call quotation quotation marks thinkers. Um, and creative thinkers about what's going on in the game uh, continually. And, and uh, that, so is, is there anything else in the book that, you know, I'm sure if you looked at a chapter and said you could talk about it, but. Yeah, you know, really that's, I could almost do that. I could almost pick out a chapter for, you know, go through a chapter and you'd probably find it, uh, you might find a few things there. I think what I, what I tried to do in the book, I've talked about, for example, uh, one chapter is called, uh, um, oh, here, one second, I'll just get my book. One <laughs> you know, I got a chapter, a chapter on proactive defending. You know, and people don't, people think you gotta be proactive offensively. I talk about being proactive defensively. And I use two examples, Chris Chelios and Brad McCrimmon. If you ever watch them play, they both were guys that used a lot of bluffs, a lot of stalls, a lot of that kind of stuff to put a little pressure on the puck carrier, make them a little nervous. And so I talk about things like that. I've got a chapter on the talent dilemma. How do you coach talent? That's not, it's not easy. Some people think coaching talent is, you know, you want talent, but along with talent, sometimes come other issues. And uh, I also talk about the, when you have talent, um, Everybody wonders why you get all the cookies. And you do. You play the power play. You're down a goal. You're going to play. If you're up two goals and you can't check, you probably won't get those cookies. But everybody wonders about um, why some of the talented players get the break they get. The, the key is the hardest skill in the game is scoring. And so when you have scores, 
you have to make some room for them to play their game. And early in my career, and Claude's a good example, probably can talk about that. I, I wanted all the players to play 200 feet. I wanted everybody to be real, real complete. And I, that was our goal because we were playing against the Russians with, uh, and they were pretty darn good. But, you know, I don't think I used um, sometimes a player's other skills as much as I could have. So I talk about that. You know, I talk about uh, uh, the playing coach. The playing coach is the organizer. Every team I've ever coached, I can pick out one or two people that I called organizers. Guys that when the, it was crunch time, uh, something broke down, they were always there. If somebody pinched, the defenseman pinched and uh, he got feathers, the guy was always there. I talk about Dave Tippett. I talk about Igor Larionov being two of the great organizers in the game. Uh, low profile guys to a certain extent, but I talk about some of those things. Um, I have one here on, I, I really like, it's called chapter called Apple Pie in the Sky. And then it says, I don't think so. I talk about what's happening in coaching now with small ice games, um, exploration learning for youngsters versus just always tell, 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 because kids can figure things out better than you think they can. But I talk about some of those things uh, in that chapter that I think are really, really uh, happening in the game today. And I think they are going to work. So, um, so I've got lots of chapters like that. I got a chapter on, well, here's a chapter I got to talk about is puck hogs. <laughs> here's a story for you. I had a guy named Cliff Ronning. Uh, Cliff Ronning. Ah, he went on to play about 12 or 13, that's it, 13 years in the NHL. Well, when I got him, he, he didn't realize the pass existed. Okay. He always wanted to have to carry the puck. And, uh, <laughs> I remember Don McLaren, a guy who could shoot the puck like 100 miles an hour, played with Cliff. He came out to practice one day with a, a duck decoy stuck on the top of his helmet. And it was to get the point across to Cliff that, you know, you might pass the puck and we could get more done. So I talk about things like that. And I, I've tried to be topical in terms of, you know, you defend to attack is the chapter that's, I think, very interesting. I talk about, uh, you know, offensive zone, zone forward strike while the iron is hot. Uh, three is a crowd, four is a party. Offense sees the moment. So I've got a lot of topics I think are driving up Main Street. Spread them out. That's the use of space. The neutral zone, better safe than sorry. Uh, the space behind the puck. I talk about the evolution of cycling. Um, and I and so I, I've, I've tried to make the first two thirds quite topical and uh, uh, include some stories. People can see where it started and uh, some of those things, Wally. So, yeah, I probably could go over a whole chapter with you. And, uh, but anyway, that's it. It's, 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 I think it's the best thing I've ever done in hockey is, is the book in terms of trying to help other people out. I think it does do that. I do realize it's a small audience. I'm not going to sell 10,000 copies. And really, I, I've not, I'm, all the money I make, I don't make any money. If I can cover my expenses in a little bit, it all goes to Hockey Canada. So I'm just doing this because, as I said earlier, Claire Drake didn't, and I tried to get him to do it. And George, George now I don't think wants to do it, but George should do it. And we should have people, like now it's video information, and, and that's good. But some of these guys who coached uh, were wonderful coaches way back in the day. Uh, guys like Toll Blake, I mean, you know, they were, uh, they're, uh, you know, they were jack of all trades, a master of some. And these guys were amazing coaches. Uh, their teams were good at things that happened a lot in the game. And uh, so I, I do, I do talk about respecting the the past a little bit too. Okay. I was just, I was just thinking uh, two things, yep. Dave. Uh, number one, Barry, it sounds like uh, you you should, if you still have a job tomorrow. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you should you should make you should make Dave's book mandatory reading for all the coaching clinics. Number one, uh, number two, Dave. Now you being a true shark. Now you're going to have to do an update yeah. the book every every three to three to five years. So you've got another couple of projects ahead of you. Hopefully, lots of projects ahead of you. Well, I'd, I'd like, I'm more than glad to be on again anytime, uh, Wally, if you want that. And I'll, I'll tell you guys in the book, the first chapter is, is entitled uh, The Times They Are A-Changing. That's Bob Dylan. And it's, it's, I felt that should be the first, channel, the first chapter because it's about environment. 
the book talks a lot about tactics and a lot about some of the tips and th reads and things I cues I've seen over my years and I thought were interesting. But I felt the first chapter strongly should be on the ethics in coaching. So it's called the times they are changing. I talk about what coaches can practically do to do a better job. And, uh, you know, the game's become so sophisticated. The preparation is so good. There's so much available to us in terms of video and tactics and analytics. Um, but you're still dealing with people. You're still trying to create a human environment. And I talk a lot about that in the first chapter. So I, I've tried to, uh, I'm trying in this book, I'm trying as hard as I can to give people food for thought so they will examine what they're doing. I'm not trying to tell people, I, I don't have all the answers. I have lots of opinions, but I don't have all the answers. And so um, I'm just trying to help the people that are coming up through the game because I was lucky when I was young and coaching to be able to look at Claire Drake's teams at Alberta. Uh, George Kingston is a wonderful hockey man at the University of Calgary. I learned from those guys. Uh, Andy Murray was in our league. Wayne Fleming was in our league. These guys are all amazing coaches. So I was lucky to be able to learn from some great people. And then I've been lucky to coach with a lot of great people too. In the years I coached uh, the NHL team Canada's at World Championships, I got to work with so many NHL coaches would come in and you'd have two assistant coaches that were NHL coaches. So uh, I've just been lucky to be so, uh, surrounded by real good players and real good people like Clody would know for sure. And uh, that combined with uh, trying to get better and, and improve your skills and do a better job for your, for your players, uh, that's what keeps you kind of going and keeps the game so exciting. Dave, I uh, just wanted to remind, uh, I didn't get on the session early. It, uh, Tim's recorded it. Rick said he recorded it. This last portion uh, where you talk about the book and the chapters, wow. Yep. Uh, your topics resonate with everything we've talked about over the years and then some, uh, not over the years, over the past four months. And yeah. uh, I'm going to edit it and definitely get it out. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, the thing with your book, and Kim would agree with this, and Daryl's book, we just don't think it's for the average minor hockey coach. But the ethical chapter in there might be, I don't know. But I'm looking at development one and above coaches, but HP1, <laughs> HP2, all the CIS coaches would receive this. Uh, they're in my list of people to communicate with. We've got about 300 people that will receive and benefit from some of these things. And uh, I'm sure we'll be able to get the, the word out on the book. And, and uh, I want to remind Rick if uh, somehow to get that to me so I can edit it further. Now, Rick is the quietest guy in the group. Dave, he says very little. He usually yeah. says, I'm just a fly on the wall. Yeah. But Rick, you can't say that. What do you got to say about this? Your chat. Just, Rick, just your listening, chance. Wally. I have. <laughs> Same as always. Yeah. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed I, I Dave, I'm, I first uh, had contact with Dave back in the early 90s at the Center of Excellence. Mm -hmm. who was a regular attendee at virtually everything he ran there. So it's great to hear you again, Dave. Thank you. Great to know you're doing well. Yeah, and uh, I'm like all you guys. I still love the game so much that uh, it uh, it's it's really a, a centerpiece for uh, my existence is the fact that I still love the game and still enjoy it. And uh, I'm so impressed with uh, I've done a lot of the Zoom stuff, you know, since the work stoppage or since the uh, the, the COVID stoppage. And uh, it just amazes me how many times I'm on Zoom calls and those kind of things with other coaches, how there's so many people that uh, love the game and want to, you know, they want to spend a lot of time at it. They're volunteering their time and really enjoying it. So, um, you know, I've tried in the book to uh, provide food for thought, even for guys coaching kids, you know, when you talk about, Puck hogs, for example, um, players won't pass the puck until they value the pass. They understand what the pass can do. The other thing is, at a young age, five, six, seven, why would a kid ever pass the puck? He hardly has it. He gets it, and you're telling me he has to pass it? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So I talk about the, you know, the common sense things 
in coaching children that I've experienced because I did a lot of hockey skill, hockey school work when I was uh, younger. And I also uh, um, worked with my grandkids at, at, when I was much older. I worked with my grandkids when they were young players. So, um, yeah, I think it's great. And uh, I think that uh, uh, if you guys are doing things, uh, the main thing is if you learn things, pass it along, you know. And uh, uh, so I really give you people a lot of credit. I know the Sharks has been going for a long time, and uh, I've heard lots about it, but it was nice to be on. And I would be glad to be on again anytime, Wally. Good. Good. Hey, hey, Dave, before you go, I, ju I just thinking in terms of your book and everything, uh, I know you mm -hmm. know Doug Dirk, Doug Dirk's uh, at CBC here, and mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to, I think I'll pop him an email, just make him aware that, that your book is out there, um, and I'll get your, um, is, is, it, is, you or, is it you or Linda, there's a 371, or would you rather use an email if he wanted to touch base with you? Uh, I'll give you, well, Tim, here's my number. Um, I don't know why Linda gave you her number. My number is 480-393-3873. So 480-393-3873. And really, guys, with your sharks, if you have a, a, a coach who would like an opinion sometimes, you know, don't be afraid to pass along my number because I always have time for coaches to, to try to be of some help provide some food for thought. And as I said, I do not have all the answers, um, but I, I think I can help in some instances. And so uh, I'm always pleased to try to help out young coaches because I I just know that when I was young, we had volunteer coaches and uh, I always appreciate the fact that uh, they were out there. They, they really didn't do very much for us in terms of hockey players. They good We learned on our own in those days, but uh, you learn more of the game shitty than you did you're slipping out again, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, get your wife in, Linda. <laughs> okay. I'll let you go. Okay. All right. Anyway, Bye, Dave. thanks for having me on. You guys take care. Okay. Feel good. Okay. Take care. Take care. Take care. Our hockey game ended. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Bye bye. Dave. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, just a little debrief, sharks. Um, I, I want. I've got lots to work with here, and I'm glad. But you know, I called Tim yesterday. I was worried about both of them being on and sort of competing.